<clears throat> Hello and very warm welcome to today's UGC Net English Literature session brought to you by IFAS. I hope you all are in good health and good mood. So today we will be delving deep into uh, your literary movements. So um, I have tried to cover as many literary movements as possible from different ages and they're going to be really important uh, from the perspective of your net set and gate examinations. So please pay undivided attention to what all things we're going to learn today. Uh, I hope, I hope, uh, I, I hope I will be able to, you know, uh, walk on the same, uh, walk on the, uh, walk on your expectations, uh, so to say. So yeah, uh, let us quickly wait. Uh, I mean, let us uh, before starting quickly, let us wait for a couple of minutes for rest of you all to join and uh, post that we're gonna start it. Okay. So uh, yeah, good evening, Rani. <clears throat> I hope your uh, preparations are going really nicely. Since uh, I, I mean, I, it's really less time that is uh, left. So yeah. All right, now let us uh, quickly begin with the session for today. Let's delve ourselves deep into literary movements and know more about it. Moving on to the first slide of the day when we'll be doing uh, three important uh, literary movements that we have. So Scottish Chaucerian, and a Scottish Chaucerian uh, was the name that was given to the group of writers who belonged to uh, approximately 15 to 16th century and uh, they were the they were the follower of uh, your Chaucer, Geoffrey Chaucer and his contemporaries. So they were uh, they were basically writing under the influence of Geoffrey Chaucer and his contemporaries. Now, these writers are really important uh, because when you look from an examination perspective, they do ask you that who among the following was uh, the Scottish Chaucerian or who among the following was Scottish Marquis. Now, Scottish Chaucerian are also... Okay, I'm going to change the color. So, yeah. <clears throat> now, Scottish Chaucerians are also called Marquis or Muckers. Okay, these were the Scottish poets who were writing uh, under the influence of your Chaucer and his contemporary. They were writing under the influence of your Chaucer and his contemporaries, uh, like Lidgit. So they were also uh, using your uh, Chaucerian stanza, uh, the seven line stanza, which we also call famously as Rhyme Royale stanza. Now, the important uh, writers who come under this group, that is Scottish Chaucerians, are uh, your. Uh, <coughs> King James, King James. Uh, then you have now King James has written King's Square, which is uh, a really important work. He has written King's Square in Rhyme Royal. Uh, Pose that Robert Henryson. Now, why Robert Henryson is famous? Because Robert Henryson has actually uh, continued the work of Chaucer that is Troilus and Cressida, which was left unfinished by Chaucer. So, yeah, Robert Henryson that way is a really important writer that we have. All right. Uh, so Robert Henryson is also one of the really important writer. Then you've got Gavin Dolis. Gavin Dolis. Uh, <clears throat> 
Now, Kevin Dolis uh, is also an important writer and who comes under this uh, whole category of Scottish Chasadians. Then finally, we've got William Dunbar. Now, William Dunbar. So, all these four uh, people are really important when we talk about uh, Scottish Chasadians. And you must, uh, you must be uh, well aware of these uh, writers that you have. All right. Let us quickly see. I'm not writing other works that are important. Let's say King James Ka King Square is really important work. Then Robert Henryson was the one who has continued the Geoffrey Chaucer's work, Troilus and Procedure. So these are the teeny mini points that you should remember. You should just mark a trick in some corner of your copy, and then you can write these uh, in your notes. All right. Now, now next, moving on to your university wits. Now, university wits are are these people? Um, are these uh, you know? This is the group of late 16th century uh, playwrights and pamphletiers who have uh, who have done their formal education from big school names or from big names. Uh, so why I say big names because Oxford and Cambridge. So all these university wits either come from Oxford or from Cambridge. So I've got a small mnemonic for you all to remember these names because they do ask. Uh, the names of your university wits. So they, they ask you that uh, who among the following was not a university wit or who among the following was a university wit. So that's really important for you to know. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm going to write the name of school. So Cambridge and then you have got Oxford, right? So it looks like Q, but okay. Yeah, Oxford. Please do let me know if you have any doubt. Now, Cambridge and Oxford, you've got two uh, two schools. And in Cambridge, in Cambridge, uh, you can use a C and G and L, P, P. Now, these are, uh, now, these are the mnemonics that you can actually use. So, I have, I have written these mnemonics on the basis of their last names. However, you can go with their first names as well. So, you can, um, you can write, oh, let's say, C, T, R. C, T, R or... Uh, JT, uh, JTG, something of that sort, right? Uh, JTG, uh, it's not LPP, it's LLP, okay? JT, JTG. Yeah, so these are the mnemonics that you can actually use to remember. Now, why I'm giving you mnemonics before the names? So now I'm gonna write names, you please note it down. It's Christopher Marlowe. You've got Christopher Marlowe. Then uh, Christopher Marlowe, you have Thomas Nash and Robert Green. Take it, Thomas Nash and Robert Green. <clears throat> I'm really sorry and apologies for the bad throat, but I have caught little uh, cold and cough. That's why I, that's why my voice is also not really proper. So uh, yeah, and then you've got John Lilai. John Lilai. Now John Lilai is the same person who has uh, who has given us this phrase. Um, Everything is fair in love and war. This is very famous. I mean, writers have been using this in Bollywood, Tollywood, and of course in Hollywood too. Now, um, now coming on to Thomas Lodge, and uh, and finally you've got George Peel. So any mnemonic that suits you, you can use. But please do remember them. All these names of university wits are really important. Now you know there's this another fact about university wit that th uh, your uh, your this person oh god Thomas Kidd. Now Thomas Kidd is sometimes uh, considered as a part of university wit. However, uh, however the main writers that are uh, that do that, that that come into this group of university wits are already mentioned here. Now another very important and star mark thing that you need to know about university wit is that this particular term was coined uh, by George Sainsbury in around uh, 19th century so this question has come uh, has came into your examination so please be mindful of that now George George Sainsbury <clears throat> I, I always have this habit of making cloud for important things. So yeah, George Sainsbury. So that's all. Uh, now, now I've got comedy of humor. So, so in those times, people used to think that, uh, so there was this idea behind comedy of humor that the bodily fluids or, or the proportion of the bodily fluids actually creates a humor. So that was, that was the idea that was behind this. So imbalance of body, I'm, I'm writing it down here. Imbalance of bodily fluid create humor 
Now there were four kinds of fluid that were uh bodily fluid creates humor. <coughs> Excuse me. And there were four types of uh, fluid. And this question has also come came into your examination uh, that there were four types of fluid that we have. Um, so you have blood, the blood, blood of course you know blood, phlegm. Then you have choler. Now choler was a yellow bile. Choler, uh, choler is a yellow bile. And then you have melancholy, melancholy. I'm I'm writing it uh, here, yellow, or you have black bile. Okay, so that it's easier for you to understand. <coughs> Now, you know who were the pioneers or who were the uh, who were the writers who actually popularized this comedy of humor? So it was Ben Johnson and George Chapman. Ben Johnson, please remember this, guys. Ben Johnson was a person who has actually uh, contributed a lot in popularizing this particular term. <clears throat> All right. Let us quickly move on to the next set of uh, movements that we have. <clears throat> Now coming into comedy of manners. Now comedy of manners was a realistic, satiristic or uh, comedy of a restoration age. So <clears throat> highlight point was restoration age. Can that was really famous restoration age. And now they actually work on bringing out the follies or on commenting these artificial high class elite societies, aristocratic societies that you have who used to have some really sophisticated kind of, uh, <clears throat> yeah, sophisticated kind of, uh, you know, stature into the society. So, yeah, so comedy of manners actually worked on those lines. So they used to satirize uh, these artificial and sophisticated societies. Um, you know, come, you know the good examples that uh, that will actually make this point very clear to you would be <clears throat> um, Oscar Wilde's uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, and you've got Rape of Locke uh, by Alexander Pope, and uh, you've got other work. Um, yeah, William Congreve's uh, William Congreve's The Way of the World, The Country Wife by William Wycherley. Now, all these works are really important uh, examples of your comedy of manners. So please, please do remember that. Uh, then you've got uh, mask. Now mask was was a very uh, royal theatrical element kind of thing. Now, these were shorter than dramas, and the number. Now these are the features that I'm actually telling you about mask. So these were shorter than dramas, and uh, <clears throat> and also uh, the the number of uh, characters that they used to put in uh, their uh, dramas. So generally, they, the men were equal to women. So that was one of the key feature of mask that you can see. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, the important, uh, the important uh, mask. So it it actually flourished uh, in between 16th, 17th century in England, and also it was it was a very um, royal as as I've as I've told you. So it was a very festive, a uh, courtly entertainment kind of thing. So yeah, I'm writing it here, courtly entertainment. So it's easier for you to write. now always do one thing. <coughs> You know, while you're preparing your notes, just just make the head points. Don't write long things. Try to make try to be as precise as possible. So it's like mask. So you should write courtly romance. Uh, the duration less than drama. Uh, then the number of men equals to women. So th these are the ideas that will actually you know take you to this whole thing. So when you're preparing notes, you should be really precise and always, always write your notes in your bullet points because that's how you can uh, actually reduce the um, number of words uh, to explain certain concepts. So yeah, the important mask that uh, you can go to and have a look at, um, I mean, not important uh, in the sense that they, the explanation do come into examination, but you just need to remember the name. So sometimes they ask you that Comus by John Milton was a dash. So was it an epic poem? Was it an uh, uh, was it a prose or was it a you know fiction uh, story or uh, was it a mask? So the correct answer would be mask. So I'm writing it here. Milton Milton has written this mask called a uh, Comus. Then uh, then you know you have got Philip Sidney Carr, Lady of May. So these are the important masks that you should at least know. Ki, okay, this particular work is a mask. So yeah, that's important. <clears throat> Coming on to the next one, you, we've got, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, 
Now, metaphysical poets, you know, metaphysical poets uh, were really famous and uh, uh, approximately in around 17th century, uh, so to say. Sorry, sorry, not non metaphysical poets, we were on Son of Ben. Now, Son of Ben, simply if you would ask me, Son of Ben, so they were just the followers of Ben Johnson. Now, a lot of Quelio poets actually described themselves as, uh, as, you know, as the follower of Ben. So, they were also called Tribe of Ben tribe of Ben. So, it was self-description of these uh, Kavalia poets. It was the self-description of uh, these Kavalia poets. Um, now, you know, uh, son of Ben, actually, there are a lot of number of people that come under this. So, you've got Richard Lovelace, you've got uh, your uh, John Suckling, uh, uh, Thomas Carew, and uh, and Robert Herrick, all these people come under uh, metaphysical, uh, sorry, son of Ben tribe. Uh, you do have William Catright and Randolph, uh, Thomas Randolph as well. So that's really important from your uh, from your examination point of view. So you should know the names also. So you can write it's uh, Kivalia poets, but almost all of the Kivalia poets, uh, not not really all, but most of the Kivalia poet would come under famous Kivalia poet would come under son of Ben. Hmm. Now let us uh, let us move to metaphysical poets. Now these uh, these group of people uh, were very different, and the important hit point that you need to remember about metaphysical poet is conceit. They were using conceit a lot. Um, again, making a beautiful cloud so that you all remember this. Now conceit, and who who coined this term? So who coined this term? That was Samuel Johnson. Samuel Johnson was the person. Who actually coined this term and where he coined this term so in lives of most eminent English poet when he was writing the life of Cowley when he was writing the life of Cowley life of Cowley ke andar, he actually gave this term metaphysical poet to certain type of writing uh, or to certain type of poets who were writing uh, their works <coughs> <laughs> in a very different way and they were using uh, conceit as well so conceit if you would ask me what is conceit so conceit is is uh, is a type of a simile or a metaphor when you are comparing or you're choking up two very different things together to make sense out of it so there's this uh, writer very famous writer now give me the name of this writer who has actually compared love no, uh, with compass. So that would be your homework if you could get me the name of the writer who has compared love with compass. So yeah, that's so these types of comparisons they used to do. Um, so that's why they were very famous for conceit. Now, the important metaphysical poise that you should know about uh, would be, of course, now also one more important thing, now T.S. Eliot has really praised uh, these metaphysical poetry, whereas Samuel Johnson was little critical about them. Um, now, now, coming on to the important metaphysical poise that you should at least know, at least you should know the names of these metaphysical poets. So, uh, you've got John Dunn, you've got George Herbert, you've got Abraham Cowley, you've got uh, uh, Thomas Tartrain, you've got Henry Wogan, you've got Richard Crosho, Andrew Marvel, John Cleveling, uh, Richard Lay, all these, all these would come under your metaphysical poets. Uh, please, please make a note of it because it won't be possible for me to write each and every uh, metaphysical poet here. So it's better if you could make note at your end. All right. Let me quickly grab water. <clears throat> now, Cavalier poets, uh, Cavalier poets were the poets that came from the classes who actually supported Charles I. These were the round as the parliament supporter kind of people. So they supported. I'm, I'm writing the, the the important point that is to be noted. Uh, so supporter supporter of Charles I. They were the supporter of Charles I. Now, their themes were very different. They were so far from religious and spiritual themes. They were more into pleasure, more into eroticism, more into, you know, uh, this, uh, this whole uh, idea of, uh, what do you call, the fun, uh, the cultural life, the pleasure, and all these things were their main themes that uh, they used to write on. <coughs> Now, uh, you know, these, the, now the example of Kavalia poets would again, uh, there were few of the tribe of Ben would also be included into your Kavalia poets. So you've got uh, Richard Lovelace, uh, John Suckling, uh, Robert Herrick, Thomas Carew, 
William D. F. Irwin. All these are all these are the writers who come under this category of Kavilya poet. Please, please make a note of this as well. <coughs> Now next, uh, you have Commedia dell'arte. Now Commedia dell'arte is also called Italian comedy. Now you know, uh, now, now these were the, there were there were this uh, character troupe who used to travel uh, in different cities and they used to perform there. And uh, I think the major themes that they actually worked on were love, uh, were jealousy, were old age. The themes that they worked on, uh, the themes that they worked on were love, jealousy, old age, and uh, old old age and also uh, they, they, made, they used to make use of these uh, stock characters stock characters then uh, then they used to have uh, happy endings they used to have happy endings so this was a type of an italian comedy which around 16 uh, i think i think 16 to 18th century and that it became very famous into your uh, england um also uh, i mean uh, in, uh, yeah england as a whole yeah uh, then uh, then you've got uh, then you've got uh, another very important kit kat club now kit kat club uh, so there's this funny story behind uh, you know the the germination of this particular name uh, so kit kat club was a group of people who has a strong political and literary association that is really important you should know strong um, strong literary and political association now uh, why i'm why i'm saying that it's really important <clears throat> because uh because the, the because this Kit Kat club was formed uh, with with this political agenda, and as I've told you that it has got a political association. So these people were associated with Whig Party, with Whig Party. Please note this down. Whig Party said they were associated, and as I told you, there's this funny story behind it. So there was this inn, uh, there was this innkeeper called Christopher Cat. He used to make a mutton pie. And uh, these people used to eat their uh, this particular uh, dish, uh, so that is why you've got Kit Kat Club, that is C A T wala Cat Club, uh, and that's how the name evolved and it became Kit Kat Club. Uh, now, you know the important uh, writers who would be considered as the part of your Kit Kat Club would be William Congreve, uh, John Locke, uh, Robert Walpole, uh, John Wenbow, Joseph Edison, Richard Steele. All these people would come under your Kit Kat Club. Now, also uh, there was this uh, there was this painter who has actually drawn uh, who has actually drawn the portrait of these forty two members that were there in Kit Kat Club, and the name of that person is Godfrey Neller. Godfrey Neller, so G O D F R E Y Godfrey Neller, K N E L L E R. So he was the person who's actually painted them uh, into into a nice portrait wherein all forty two members were there. So yeah, that's that that was the story actually about Kit Kat Club. Now let us move on uh, to Scribblers Club. Uh, Scribblers Club is. Um, yeah now scribblers club so as i as i've told you that kit kat club has got political and literary association and they were the Whig party uh Whig party supporters so scribblers club was tory party supporters i mean people uh, who supported tory party would come under scribblers club now you know this was the informal group this was the informal group um and and uh, an important part about it that uh, it, it it came it or it uh, popped up around 18th century uh, so to say the important writers that were there were your alexander pope jonathan swift uh, arbuthnot uh, john arbuthnot john gay francis arthurai and thomas parnell all these peoples were actually the part of your scribblers club also they have got this fictional uh, hack uh, hack uh, person they created uh, as Martinus Scribblers. So this particular person, I'm, I'm going to write this Martinus um, because later few writers have actually made Martinus Scribblers, th this uh, fictional character as, as the protagonist of their work. So that's really important. Um, and you know, this particular uh, name actually came from your John Dryden's uh, one of the comic, uh, if I'm not wrong. 
yeah so i think uh, i think all the important things that i that you should know about both of these clubs are covered um so if i have spoken and not written it is your duty to write it down uh, i hope i hope uh, it's clear to my audience please do let me know if you have any doubt and if you are uh, on the same page with me please put in the comment section yes no baby so that i can understand whether you all are able to understand it or not please put in y n so yes for y uh, y for yes and n for no y n a and maybe also you can put in so um all right i actually am waiting for your responses so quickly put in y n that i at least understand that we are on the same page and you all are understanding it by the time i'm going to grab uh, my bottle <clears throat> all right i think i think uh, everyone's little fishy about it or or probably scared <laughs> but don't worry guys all right let us come on uh, to another very important aspect that we all should know about that is graveyard poetry now graveyard poetry uh, interestingly was a precursor of your romantic era a uh, romantic movement and your gothic literature now now these graveyard poetry is uh, yeah graveyard poetry uh, is also called uh, your churchyard poetry precursor or romantic and apka gothic okay i'm not writing completely but you just understand this now another person and uh, there are few very famous person who would come under your graveyard poetry and uh, you know exams that is do ask such questions from you so please be very attentive now now uh, elegy written in a country churchyard by thomas gray is one of uh, is considered to be one of the cult work that you have in uh, graveyard poetry Thomas Gray ka elegy written in a country churchyard then you have Thomas Parnell Thomas Parnell um, who has written a night piece on death a night piece on death i'm not writing it here but please make a point that you are writing uh, the works as well Thomas Parnell you have Thomas Parnell who has written uh, who has written your uh, what do you call a night piece on death then you've got Robert Blair Robert Blair has written uh, the grave <clears throat> yeah and then you've got edward young edward young is also uh, an important graveyard poet now edward young has written uh, night thoughts night thoughts theek okay? hai edward young has written night thoughts i hope that's clear to you all now uh, the, of course apart from them there are several other poets that are included so i'm going to once again repeat all these names so that if you miss upon any one of them you can quickly note it down So Thomas Parnell, Thomas Wotton, uh, Thomas Percy, Thomas Gray, Oliver Goldsmith, William Cooper, William Collins, uh, Robert Blair, Edward Young. All these come under your graveyard poets. Okay, I hope that's uh, that's clear to you. Also, one one of the really important feature about graveyard poetry. So if you'll go through any of the graveyard poetry, let's see if you go through. So I think uh, Thomas Gray ka LG Eater in a Country Churchyard. Everyone we must have. I mean, every one of you might have uh, read it either in your bachelor's or your master's. So you know you will find it that those works are really introspective. They are very meditative in nature. So that's that's one of the key feature that you can find in your graveyard literature. all right now let us quickly move on uh, to the next uh, to the next uh, that we have that is lake poets now these were also called bard of lakes they were also called what they were called bard of lake now uh, now you know why why do we, why do they get this lake poets name because these were the writers of uh, of the first half of your 19th century who were living in lake district so lake was the district and they were living in lake district so that's why th they they gained this name of lake poet now who all were included uh, or who all were the part of your lake poets so it's wordsworth it's wordsworth coleridge
एंड यू आर साउदी रॉबर्ट साउदी आई मीन तो या मोस्ट ऑफ सो ऑलमोस्ट फर्स्ट जनरेशन पोइट्स आर वो देयर नाउ या दे दे वर कंसीडर्ड एज द पायनियर ऑफ योर रोमांटिक मूवमेंट्स एज वेल सो या दैट्स इंपॉर्टेंट टू नोट द द हिट पॉइंट इज लेक डिस्ट्रिक्ट दे बिलोंग दे केम फ्रॉम लेक डिस्ट्रिक्ट्स दैट्स व्हाई दे वर कॉल्ड लेक पोइट्स all right now uh, now you give now you've got another uh, another set of important literary movements that came not romanticism romanticism just like renaissance it was a huge movement uh, whether you talk about architecture whether you talk about literature whether you talk about artistic uh, or let's say painting or uh, uh, you know uh, music intellectual so this was a movement which involves artistic literally uh, literary uh, literature music and intellectual uh, things now this focuses more on emotions uh, over a reason so i'm i'm drawing it in a very mathematical sense so emotion over so basically it was a reaction against your enlightenment age reaction against your now famous authors again of romanticism if you would ask i would of course include your wordsworth coleridge robert southey then you have got lord byron then uh, uh, your p b shelley percy by c shelley john keats all these writers would come under your romanticism um, now, now these people for them emotions were of course greater than uh, than your reasons and um, yeah so so uh, yeah that's all, that's all i think that's really important from your uh, this point of view now famous uh, no no these people these romantic writers they they believed more in celebrating euphoria and sublimity so celebration of euphoria and sublimity were there were there key uh, you know key treatments or what do you call um, a key feature only you can uh, take it as uh, and sublimity so this question is actually came into an examination that these people celebrated euphoria and sublimity so romantic writers or the romanticism uh, movement as a whole actually celebrated euphoria and sublimity so yeah that's all now uh, let us quickly uh, move on to the next topic that we have that is dark romanticism now dark romanticism was an american movement Mm-hmm. Now, please remember, dark romanticism was an American movement. <clears throat> dark romanticism was an American movement. It was a subgenre of your romanticism only. but an important thing that it was a reaction against transcendentalism we're going to of course uh, know what but actually in, in the later part of it you'll actually get to know what is transcendentalism so it was reaction against transcendentalism so it it basically uh, reflected the fascination with irrational melancholia ghost gothic um and all these uh, demonic and grotesque things so it was it was this thing that is uh, they they had this fascination with all these certain th- uh, types of things that i actually mentioned that irrational grotesque demonic melancholic gothic and uh, gory kind of um, you know a ghostly kind of uh, things uh, now these dark romanticism uh, so this name the important uh, part that you need to note down that the name uh, that the name was given by uh, was given by a literary theorist mario praz was given by uh, 
Mario Pras. Please, please note this down, guys. Now, Mario Pras was a literary theorist. Actually, gave this name dark romanticism. The 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 authors that you can include under this head would be Edgar Allan Poe. Remember Edgar Allan Poe, who has written uh this beautiful poem, The Raven, uh, when we have Eleanor and all. Then, uh, then you've got Nathaniel Hawthorne, the writer of the Scarlet Letter, very famous, a uh, very famous and very nice book that we have. Um, uh, then, uh, then post that uh, you've got Herman Melville as well, uh, the, the the Moby Dick writer. So yeah, that's uh, so all these people would be included into your dark romanticism. I'm I'm gonna write the surnames of them so it's easier for you to quickly know Poe and Hawthorne. So that's really important. And Herman. Okay, sorry, I said surnames, but fine. The half names take it that way is Herman Melville, uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and your Edgar Allan Poe. All right, let us quickly move on to your American Romanticism. American Romanticism actually focused on fiction, it focused on fiction. And in, in and it talked uh, and it talked about a dark uh, dark side of uh, American history. So um, I'm writing both the important uh, points that you need to know about it. So dark aspects of your uh, dark aspects of American history. Now, one of the famous writers uh, of your American romanticism would again be Nathaniel Hawthorne. I'm writing it here, Nathaniel Hawthorne. And there's this one more writer that uh, that you should know about, Washington Irving. Washington Irving would also, uh, I mean, we would also count him into your American romantic writer, Washington Irving. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, then moving on to your gothic novels. Now, gothic novels, is, there are some novels which has, which has got certain features or uh, or let's say in a layman's term, I would say that there's this checklist that you need to, uh, you know, check uh, for a novel to be a gothic. Now, gothic uh, usually includes supernatural ghostly elements. Then you have got the play of light that is there's more darkness over light. Um, then then you've got uh, so so the architecture is also very different or the settings of uh, gothic novels are really different which uh, sometimes include hereditary curses as well so these so these these kinds of buildings you have the canonical uh, shape of buildings the old palaces uh, the the old the old things that you have uh, and you know uh, <clears throat> Gothic novels may uh, so there is this melancholia, there is this ghostly figure, supernatural uh, supernatural elements that are included in it. Uh, there is uh, there is suffering, uh, not not suffering, but yeah, there is this fear and you know um, the very different kind of setting from your archetypal uh, novel types uh, from a different genre. So, uh, so there is horror as well in gothic novels. Uh, no, no, I think I think this point would be more clear if you would look at the examples of gothic novel. So, uh, so the writer Horace Walpole um, has written Castle of Atlanto. Horace Walpole. Then you have uh, you've got Anne Redcliffe as well, who has written this work, Anne Redcliffe. <clears throat> the Mysteries of Adolfo. The Mysteries of Adolfo is written by Anne Redcliffe, which is one of the very famous work. Uh, then you've got Th Thomas Beckford. You've got uh, Matthew Lewis, is the person who has actually written Monk, which is also asked into your examination. Then you've got Clara Reeve, C L A R A R W E V E. He's also considered as one. So now these all authors are considered as uh, the famous writers who have written or who have given or who have contributed in, uh, you know, building up this gothic literature or who have written the gothic novels so yeah that's that's all you need to know about gothic novels let us quickly move on quickly move on to transcendentalist so you you now by the time you already know that transcendentalism was also a movement and it was an american movement It was also called abolitionist movement because these people were uh, very much against slavery. 
now now this in in this movement they talked about self reliance i'm going to put down some features uh, of its self reliance ke upar they used to talk a lot about self reliance um you know and then they were so they were actually protesting against uh spirituality and your intellectualism uh and and for them for them they laid emphasize or stress more on uh, the power of intuition the power of inner mind that you have so for them intuition was a really important aspect and you know the, the beautiful thing and that will make you actually proud if you are uh, from india so um so these people transcendentalism peer uh, transcendentalist were actually inspired by indian uh, by indian mythology so geeta was a, one of the cult work that actually um, inspired them and uh, as i told you they were they were very much uh, influenced by our indian religion so that's really important uh, about transcendental uh, writers so as i told you they they were focusing more on power of individual on freedom on your intuitions and uh, so those, so they they in a way you can say that they shared uh, somewhat same beliefs with your british romantic writers uh, so yeah that's that, that's i think that is all uh, you need to know about uh, transcendentalism also one important thing that you can note down is that they they uh, they disregarded the use of modern technologies so uh, yeah now important names that actually come under this category of transcendentalism would be ralph waldo emerson i'm going to write this ralph waldo emerson <clears throat> then you have henry david thoreau and uh, yeah um no walt whitman uh, would also uh, be considered as one of the one of the your transcendentalists and and american uh, feminist uh, margaret fuller margaret fuller is also counted um, as one of the transcendentalist uh, writer of that time and uh, you've got frederick henry hedge uh, again as as again was a part of the you know, transcendentalist movement as well so yeah now let us quickly move on to the next one now you know i i want to actually tell you so uh, so while while going through these notes i actually came up with this uh, new so it is not really related to this but you should know about it so there is this term blazon so blazon means to compare female body compare female body So I was actually uh so I was actually reading something and then I suddenly came upon this word so I thought of sharing it with you now blazon is something uh, so blazon is a term or is a device that we actually use when we are comparing female body with jewel celestial bodies or some rare objects or some rare objects guys it has not uh, something related to your uh, romantic era or any of the movements but it is something that actually popped up in my mind and i thought of sharing with you so this might help you this might uh, come as a question or this might land as a question in your examination so why to take risk right now blazon a uh, blazon was actually used uh, by your uh, writer edmund spencer in epithelamin edmund spencer ne epithelamin ke andar he has actually made use of blazon and he has compared female body to jo- jewel that is jewel jewelry money that you call in hindi celestial bodies and of course the rare precious objects that you have so yeah that is something that i wanted to share with you all right back to where we were uh, quickly on the movements uh, <clears throat> yeah so the next one is here we go So now we have got uh now we've got satanic school now satanic school is uh so this was the name under which robert saudi so so actually there was this criticism game that was going on between saudi and saudi on one hand and byron and shelley on the another hand okay now you know this was the name satanic school that was used by our robert saudi 
to criticize the writings of the group of people that, that were actually headed by our Lord Byron. and Shelley. So specifically Lord Byron Cooper, this was the whole comment that was put on but of course Shelley was also there. Now, uh, now, now in, in, in Vision of so, uh, Robert Saudi in Vision of Judgment had actually criticized uh, Lord Byron and Shelley and why he has uh, criticized is because according to Robert Saudi, uh, the works of Byron, Shelley and the group uh, and the group of people who were uh, actually, uh, you know, who would uh, very closely associate with Byron and Shelley <coughs> or the group that was headed by Byron and Shelley. So they were, um, they, the characters that were there were very, uh, you know, um, I mean, their work was categorized or was characterized by satanic uh, spirits or satanic words, uh, yeah, satanic spirits, so to say. Um, and, and they were very high on pride and audacious uh, in petty. So that was a thing. So that according to Robert Saudi, uh, their work were characterized by uh, satanic uh, uh, satanic uh, spirit so that's why you know and he also believed that uh, the they they were not up to the mark uh, as per the literary uh, reverend figures that we have according to Robert Saudi again um, I'm repeating so yeah so so now in 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 response uh, to that Lord Byron has also written vision of judgment and he took it in a in a very um, you know, to say in a very positive way because then uh, because post that uh, Lord Byron actually came up with this concept of Byronic hero. So uh, Robert Saudi actually criticized Ro Lord Byron but then that was you know kind of a blessing in disguise for Byron and he came up with this entirely new type of hero that is Byronic hero is exactly opposite to your archetypal romantic hero. So yeah that was the thing uh, about you know Lord Byron and this whole Satanic school drama. Okay, now let us quickly move on to Cockney School. Now, Cockney School, again, this term was introduced. This term was introduced. Uh, Blackwood's Magazine. So it was around 18, 1817 or 18, uh, yeah, 1817 around this term was uh, introduced in Blackwood ma magazine. And the people, uh, the people whom we actually count under this particular head would be P.B. Shelley, John Keats, Lee Hunt and uh, William Hazlitt, of course. Um, so now why, why, so this was of course a derogatory term, uh, just like Satanic School. So they both were the derogatory terms only. No, because because few people think that uh, Shelley and 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 the group uh, like William uh, Lee Hunt, William Hazlitt, uh, so they they used to have I mean low diction uh, so to say. So they they basically uh, the lack of pedigree and so, uh, sophistication were there in their work. So that is why they were condemned with this uh, uh, with this title of Cockney School. Okay, now John Wilson was the person who actually attacked Keats uh, Endymion in quarterly review. So that the, the person's name was John Wilson who actually attacked uh, Keats and Demian. So, uh, so important writers that we include under your Cockney school would be Keats, Hunt, <coughs> and Shelley. Okay, lack of pedigree and sophistication. I'm writing it here. Uh, lack of pedigree and sophistication. Also, you can write that low diction in simple language. If you want to know, you should write low diction. Having low diction. I hope so far, uh, I hope, I'm saying flower. I hope so far it's clear to you all. Now coming on to the last two terms of the day that we have, now aestheticism. Aestheticism, uh, so wherever you hear aestheticism, art for art say, should pop, uh, should pop in your head because that's the term which is associated with it. I'm quickly right, art for art's sake. Now, as I've told you, all the important things when I write, I actually make a cloud for that. So, uh, so yeah, let me make it 
for this one also yeah so again you've got cloud here made very well now it was an intellectual art movement it was an intellectual art movement that you can say intellectual art movement um uh, and and this term art for art sake was coined by again see i'm writing it i'm making these bubbles so victor cousin victor cousin was the person who actually uh, came up with this term <clears throat> who came up with this term art for art sake now uh, no, uh, no, you know um, so so art for art sake or aesthetic movements uh, movement was laying more importance on aesthetic essence rather than on social and political value of the particular piece of art so that was the main idea behind aestheticism that for them aesthetics were more important than political or social value i'm going to write it for you again so um, so for them okay let me write it here aesthetic value was greater than political or social now now i hope that would be very clear to you you can of course make such kind of notes when you are writing down now the important or the supporters of that mo uh, that movements were walter peter then of course oscar wilde harold bloom all these people were actually supporting your aesthetic movements they were also writing their work um, on the same lines so that's really important now uh, now <clears throat> this particular movement aestheticism actually challenged the views of uh, victorian uh, victorian age so that was the thing about it um yeah so this movement also this movement was started in the radical house of your dg rossetti and uh, william morris so that's that's the hidden story behind this particular movement all right now let us uh, let us quickly move on uh, to the uh, and one more important thing that has came into your examination and i forgot to mention so there was this yellow book the yellow book periodical that is associated with your aesthetic movement or art for art sake movement is the yellow book please remember this guys note this down just make an asterisk and just note this down okay it uh, it was it was the reaction against ugliness and philistinism so to say um yeah that's all that's all i think that is enough that you need to know about it and i've already mentioned that it was um it became prominent it gained popularity during the late 19th century in england all right let me grab a sip of water and then we'll continue okay now i've got fireside poets uh, you also very famously call them brahmin poets <clears throat> or school a lot of names are actually assigned to them school room poets or household poets all these names they've got so many uh, nicknames or to say household household um, poets as well now this was the group of 19th century american poet who used to write on certain themes uh, and they used to you know recite their works uh, probably by near to the bonfire or near uh, or uh, in the small schools uh, or the classrooms <coughs> and uh, you know or near the or in the household so they used to sit and then kind of a jamming session which in modern day we call so something of that sort only now um, you know they, they, they all these works actually inculcated wisdom or there was this moral value that was hidden behind their work uh, or 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 patriotic feeling was also one of the theme of their works now important writers that would come under your fireside poets would be uh, your henry woodworth longfellow william cullen bryant and uh, oliver wendell holmes so all these were the important writers john greenland william uh, whittier was also one of the your fireside poets so yeah i think i think uh, that is that is enough and that uh, you should know about 
um, all these movements. Uh, Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood is also an important movement that you should know about. And you should also know about the seven members that were there, including D.G. Rossetti, Willem Morris, and uh, William Hunt. Uh, so all these were the important members that you can know about. Germ, Germ was the periodical that was associated with Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Uh, so that is also an important thing. So sometimes they, they do ask you how many members are there. So you can quickly mark seven uh, members were there. Now why, why this name Pre-Raphaelite were given to them? So they actually denounced the classical uh, classical or the ideas that were popping in your renaissance period so they renounces classical ideas and they were more into middle age uh, middle age art forms which was before Raphael so Raphael was a long back he was a painter of middle ages and before Raphael um, was actually the time period which inspired your pre-Raphaelite brotherhood so, so they rejected classical influence of uh, Renaissance and they turned towards medieval Italian art, which was uh, before Raphael. So that's why you have got this name, Free Raphaelite Brotherhood. And um, yeah, they used to talk. They, I mean, they focused more on simplicity, truthfulness, bare, um, blank sexuality, vulgarity. All these things were their forties. Uh, of course, naturalism as well. So, and and of course, they were, uh, you know. Uh, this this pre-Raphaelite brotherhoods were highly criticized by your Victorian uh, audience, just the way art for art's sake was also criticized by our Victorian audience. So I think uh, I think I think that's all about um, that's all about uh, literary device uh, literary movements. Uh, that is enough. So if you if you if you do this lecture of today very nicely, you are really good to go ahead for your examination because this is maximum that you should know about literary movements. So uh, I think by by large and uh, whole we have covered everything. So yeah, that's all about it. If you have any doubts, please put in uh, the comment section and do let me know. At least intimate me. Also from the next time, if you have any doubts, if you want me to pause, you can definitely intimate uh, me by putting or uh, commenting in the, you know, comment box. So yeah, that's all. Uh, that's all for today. Let us, uh, let us um, end the class for today. I had a really wonderful time with you all. I hope, I hope you get a learning, a good, good amount of learning from the session. So all the best to you guys for your preparation and happy learning. Bye-bye. Take care.